Picture this. Boris, an adult male polar bear, is having his yearly checkup. He gets measured and weighed, and things look promising. A steady stream of Arctic snacks have kept our fluffy friend healthy and primed for another year of terrorizing nearby seals. But as we're writing down everything there is to know about Boris right now, the questions start. Do we say Boris is 1102.4 pounds? Or do we make things sound a little bit more vague and say he's a stocky guy with white fur? Do we mention that he's got a scar over his left eye or what percentile of polar bears he's in when it comes down to downing seal snacks? Maybe we're also thinking about the temperature outside where it needs to be super cold for Boris to happily spend his days in hot pursuit of those pesky seals. We put out a thermometer to get a sense of just how frosty it is. But do we say that there's snow on the ground or that the temperature is negative 10.2 degrees Fahrenheit? Or do we use Celsius, like real scientists? All of this information could be useful, but what do we need to answer our questions? Hi, I'm Sabrina Cruz, and this is Study Hall, real world statistics. Everywhere in life, we're surrounded by data. But in order for us to be able to use this information to answer our questions, we need to understand it. Knowing more about the data we're dealing with informs everything we do next, from the questions we can answer to how we can answer them. Right off the bat, we have to start breaking our data down into types that we can work with. So to figure out what information we need on our polar bear checkup expedition, we first have to make a distinction between qualitative and quantitative data. Understanding which of these we're dealing with will determine how we proceed next. Like we talked about in our episode on data collection methods, quantitative data are anything we can easily measure or count. For example, we can add Boris's weight to those of his fellow fluffy friends to get a total weight for him and his polar bros. Qualitative data, also called categorical data, represent groups or categories and are not easily recognizable as numbers that we can do math with. Like the various snacks that keep Boris and his homies well fed throughout the year. What would it mean to take an average of favorite seal flavors anyway. Different types of data are best for doing certain types of analyses, but also for answering certain questions. For example, qualitative data could help a research center figure out who is more likely to sign up for a polar bear weighing expedition. The responses from a survey asking scientists if they prefer a warm or cold climate will be qualitative. And in this case, the responses are also binary, meaning that they only have two possible values. Variables like that are also called dichotomous. For example, with dichotomous variables, you could sort sizes into small and large, and then try to answer questions like, is Boris small? And is an orca whale large? Qualitative data are also used constantly in fields like sociology, where researchers will study groups like those defined by education or social class. Sometimes qualitative data can essentially be translated into quantitative data, like through Likert scale variables. These data look pretty basic. Think of the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. But in this case, each number represents a category, like strongly disagree to strongly agree. Like polling how seals feel about whether polar bears should, in fact, be packing on the pounds throughout the year. They aren't biased at all. Figuring out whether you're dealing with qualitative or quantitative data is an important first step because it will determine what questions you can answer and how you can answer them. But it won't tell you everything about the type of data you're working with. If we're counting the number of polar bears that come plodding over curiously as we weigh their friends, we know we're working with quantitative data. But in this case, we're also working with discrete data, which can only take on values that differ by a fixed amount. Think of when you count one, two, three, and so on. You can't count half a polar bear. You could but it would be very upsetting. Discrete data appear in a wide range of scenarios, like business inventory management, where the count of items stored, shipped, and sold might help you answer research questions about supply and demand, or what you need for an Arctic expedition. Then there's ecology, where counting seals in an area might help you answer research questions about population growth and decline. But some data can go the extra mile and account for those extra decimal points we aren't getting with discrete data. Continuous data include anything that can take on any value, not just whole numbers, like polar bear weight or temperature in degrees. It can easily be 10.2 degrees. But even if it's exactly 10 degrees outside when you lead Boris to the enormous polar bear scale, a precise measurement will give you 10.0 degrees, which is a different 10 than the count of curious polar bears slowly wrecking your equipment. If you record continuous data, like the temperature to three decimal points, you can always turn your data into discrete data by rounding. However, you can't go the other way 
way around. If you only record the temperature to the nearest degree, you won't be able to recover more precise values later on. Some things can't be measured continuously no matter what, but it's a good practice to measure as precisely as your measurement tools allow. You can always make the data less precise later on if need be, like by rounding up or down. Both quantitative and qualitative data can be further classified, and those distinctions change how we interpret the data as we answer our questions. Like before we go comparing quantitative data points, we have to think about zero for a second. If we see a zero in our data on distance, like the number of miles Boris ran today, that means Boris did not feel like running today. He really did run zero miles. The same is true for data like age. A polar bear cub can be zero years old. Data collected on a scale where zero really means nothing to see here are called ratio data. But there are times where a zero doesn't actually mean nothing happened. Take temperature. Zero degrees Fahrenheit doesn't mean that there's no temperature there because it does have a value and it's cold. Quantitative data where zero is more of a placeholder than a real representation of, well, nothing, are called interval data. The distinction between interval and ratio data is most important when thinking about what it means to be twice as much as something else. Like 40 degrees Fahrenheit is not twice as hot as 20 degrees Fahrenheit. On the other hand, something like salaries are an example of ratio data, and a salary of $100,000 is twice as much as a salary of $50,000 before taxes, of course. Researchers in the natural sciences often work with continuous quantitative data that can use both interval and ratio types of measurement. Medical research, for example, can involve ratio data for blood pressure or heart rate to answer questions about the effectiveness of certain medicines, like whether a nice little shot will calm down a polar bear for the next hour so that it stops attacking the scales. Social scientists work with continuous measurements too. Much of economic and finance data are ratio data and have true zeros. You can earn zero dollars in income or earn a zero on a company's performance benchmark. But in all this work, you could still be dealing with a 12-hour clock, which has no true zero and uses interval data. Qualitative data can also be further classified into other types of data. Nominal data represent groups where there's no hierarchy of the responses. A survey looking at where polar bears live, for example, might show that our majestic snow monarchs are terrorizing seals across the Arctic, from Russia and Svalbard to Canada and in Greenland. But there isn't a sense that being a polar bear from Russia is better than being from Canada. However, as a Canadian, we all know my preference. Ordinal data represent what it sounds like. The categories have some natural order to them. If we divided all of the female polar bears into categories based on whether they had cubs in each of the last five years, we'd be dealing with groups, but we'd still have frequencies like always, sometimes, or never. You can also think about how the categories might appear on a survey. Would the survey be just as easy to fill out if the categories were reordered? Like if the option for recording a bear that always had cubs came after the option for sometimes, but before the option for never. If changing the order of the potential answers would make things confusing, that indicates data may be ordinal. Understanding all of this is really helpful in many situations. Like say when your famously scatterbrained friend Kevin, an Arctic researcher, calls you in a panic. His coworkers have a lot of polar bear questions and want the data he collected on a recent trip. Kevin has been trying to get a sense of how one group of polar bears are doing based on many variables, but he didn't do a great job with his notes on that trip, and now he's in a pickle. For starters, Kevin wanted to see how many bears were in the same home range, which he did from a helicopter. You see, he was excited to see the bears, but he stayed in the helicopter when he remembered just how big they are. That gave him discrete ratio data. If he didn't spot any polar bears, he thought that meant that there was nothing to see. But some of the bears, which are white, were camouflaged by the snow which is also white, so he majorly undercounted. That is a big problem. It means that Kevin has no idea how many bears there are in the area. So you advise Kevin to go back and put tracking collars on every bear. Those show how far each bear traveled in a given day and identify how big its home range is. That's continuous ratio data. You can have one bear's distance traveled be just 0.1 meters away from another's, and its home range size being 0.6 acres less. But Kevin also didn't write down a lot of other important details that his coworkers want to know. I 
don't know what Kevin was doing there, to be honest. So you tell him to go a step further and classify the home range area into different bear personalities. The homebodies who don't stray that far, the standard bear that moves around like most other bears, and the adventurers who travel super far. That's qualitative ordinal data, since the adventurer bear typically travels more than the standard bear who travels more than the homebody bear. You can also tell if one bear came within 100 feet of another collared bear during their travels, which is dichotomous qualitative nominal data. Collecting this information will help Kevin get out of hot water at work, but maybe he should consider a career change. Not all data points are the same. Their type and level of measurement affect what stories they can tell and what questions they can answer. Understanding different types of data right now will help us later as we learn statistical methods for analyzing those data. And ensuring our data are precise now will make everything easier for us down the line and for anyone else who needs our research in the future. Did you hear that, Kevin? If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full Study Hall Real World Statistics course and earning a college credit from ASU, check out GoStudyHall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, tell us what you'd name the polar bear you're studying, and destroy that subscribe button like a polar bear destroying a seal. Thank you for watching. See you next time.